Good afternoon, good evening. Uh, thank you for joining us in a continuation of our Hogue lecture series. I'm Dr. Travis G'day. I'm one of the orthopedic surgeons from the Hogue Orthopedic Institute. Um, tonight we're talking about hip arthritis. Um, so I will uh, go through uh, the history of arthritis and uh, what you can expect as far as treatment goes uh, in 2020. Um, again, I'm uh, Dr. Skidey. Uh, one of the uh, orthopedic surgeons down at the Hogue Orthopedic Institute um, down in Irvine, and we'll uh, kind of go through what, what, what you can expect uh, as you um, diagnosed and treated with uh, hip arthritis in 2020. So hip arthritis, what's new uh, in, in, in 2020? We'll get right into it. Um, Again, Dr. Skidey from the Hogue Orthopedic Institute. Uh, so we'll start first uh, with a little introduction. Um, we'll go through uh, what exactly hip arthritis is. Uh, we'll talk a little bit of the history of the treatment of, of, of hip arthritis, and we'll uh, talk a lot about the non-operative options, and then finally get into the operative treatment. Uh, before I get there, I just want to introduce you to the, the Hogue Orthopedic Institute. Um, so. This is an orthopedic only hospital uh, down in Irvine. Uh, we've got about 70 beds, nine operating rooms, and all we do is orthopedic uh, care. Uh, we are quite busy. Uh, if you look at it, a uh, 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 significant amount of surgeries down here um, at this hospital, uh, nearly 2,000 um, hip and knee replacements uh, per year. Um, uh, and as we do more and more surgeries, uh, the patients are recovering a little bit sooner and are able to, uh, to leave the hospital uh, with shorter, shorter stays. If you look at just out in California, uh, we did the most joint replacements in the whole state uh, for, over the last few years, and this has continued to go up um, uh, over the last five years, uh, and then in Orange County, too. Um, and then we've got a few accolades from some of the uh, local ratings, um, uh, companies. Myself, I work for uh, a private practice uh, called the Orthopedic Specialty Institute. Uh, we're a, a large private practice, about 26 physicians. Uh, we uh, have locations in or Irvine and Orange uh, and can treat everything from hip arthritis to back pain. Um, and, and we have a very close affiliation with, uh, with Hogue. Um, so get into the program. Uh, so what is the hip? Uh, the hip is a ball and socket joint. Um, the uh, ball is uh, the top of the femur, uh, and it articulates or sit in, s sits in the socket of the pelvis called the acetabulum. Uh, it looks a bit like a light bulb. Uh, you see the, the, the neck of the femur is skinny, then it goes into the ball. Um, the ball sits inside the socket. The space between the ball and the socket is where the cartilage lives. Um, so the more space, the better. So what is arthritis? Um, arthritis is just a general term for any inflammation in the joint. Um, all types of arthritis lead to the same endpoint, which is a loss of, of the cartilage, loss of articular cartilage. Uh, once the cartilage is gone, the bone gets exposed, uh, which leads to pain. Uh, so there are multiple types of arthritis, the most common being osteoarthritis, or is general wear and tear, um, followed by some of the inflammatory arthritis, uh, such as rheumatoid arthritis or lupus or um, some of the other autoimmune diseases. Post-traumatic arthritis, that's for patients that have either broken their hip or dislocated their hip, that can lead to arthritic changes down the road. Uh, developmental arthritis for uh, People that are born uh, with uh, hips that don't form correctly, that can lead to arthritic changes uh, later in life. And finally, septic arthritis or, or an infection in a native hip, which is quite rare but can be devastating uh, and lead to, uh, uh, to joint uh, damage. Um, so arthritis in general uh, affects uh, uh, the knee most commonly, the hip, hip would be second. Um, as far as uh, the breakdown between men and women, it, it appears to be pretty equal right down the middle. Uh, and if you look at people over 65, over 50% of them will have 
uh, some type of arthritis in, in, in a joint. Um, there are some predisposing factors. So first would be age, um, weight. Uh, so at some point, uh, it does matter how much stress you put on the joints. So a higher weight would be higher stress. Uh, also your activity level. Uh, the more active you are, uh, the higher risk you're going to wear out um, the joint. Uh, there are some genetic uh, causes for arthritis, but these are relatively rare and poorly understood currently. So what do I normally hear of patients coming in complaining of uh, that have uh, osteoarthritis? So uh, most commonly it's groin pain. Uh, people will come in and say, Doc, I feel like I, st I pulled my groin. I was walking, I was doing X, Y, and Z, and uh, I thought I just strained it, but it's been a few weeks now. It's a very common story I hear. Um, the nerves that go to the hip joint run right in, right by the groin, and uh, oftentimes the pain is manifested as a, as a groin pull. So this x-ray you're seeing on your screen on the right side, that's an arthritic hip. You can see that there's no uh, joint space between the ball and the socket. Um, uh, you see some whitening of the bone. That's also another uh, sign of arthritis. Um, uh, occasionally, people will also complain of knee pain about 10 to 15 percent of the time. Uh, people will have uh, uh, knee pain even if had you know a, a knee injection, uh, but their X-rays are pretty normal. Uh, it's very common. Uh, can cause uh, uh, the hip to be an issue. Uh, uh, the biggest complaint as far as function goes is people have difficulty putting on their socks and shoes or getting out of a low car uh, can oftentimes be a result of hip arthritis. Um, so I'll kind of run through some of the current treatment options. This is a great website uh, by the American Academy of Orthopedic Surgeons. Uh, we came out and gave some uh, uh, research guided uh, treatment options and uh, and recommendations, and you can individualize it. If you go go to this website, you can put in your symptoms, and they can tell you what's been shown to work uh, and what hasn't. So first, it's, it's pretty obvious is uh, uh, weight loss. Um, it's just going to decrease the stress across the joint. Um, this is often often due to diet changes, as most of my hip patients are unable to increase their activity level to. Uh, dramatically change their weight and oftentimes I will uh, refer uh, to diet programs locally um, to aid in the weight loss. Uh, next would be physical therapy. Very good for mild to moderate arthritic symptoms. Um, can improve your function and your pain. Uh, classically we see about a nine month uh, length of improvement uh, and this has been shown in uh, multiple research studies. After uh, physical therapy we get into some of the medical treatment. Uh, the, the mainstay for um, arthritic pain are non-steroidal anti-inflammatories. These are things like ibuprofen or Advil and naproxen or Aleve. There's also multiple uh, prescription strength anti-inflammatories. You see the list there. Uh, they all work through the same mechanism of action. They all decrease the inflammation in the joint. These are by far the most effective at arthritic pain. They all have the same side effect profile, meaning kidney and stomach issues. And if you're taking these medications on a regular basis, we need to make sure your, your, your primary care doctor is checking your kidney function. Um, there's many um, studies showing that uh, anti-inflammatories are excellent pain relievers for arthritic pain. Next would be Tylenol or acetaminophen. Not quite as effective. Um, uh, it works mostly uh, centrally in the brain and just hasn't had a, quite a success um, as the anti-inflammatories. And then I will commonly get asked about other medications. Um, most commonly is glucosamine and chondroitin and other type of herbal supplements. Unfortunately, there's nothing that has been proven to make a dramatic difference in your arthritic pain. Uh, glucosamine and chondroitin is the best studied of all these medications. Uh, and unfortunately, it's, it has been uh, no better than a, than a placebo. After we get past the medications, uh, another option is an injection. Uh, these need to be either ultrasound or x-ray guided 
to ensure we get the medication into the joint. This can usually be done in the office. It's a relatively quick procedure. Uh, the most common medication given is a simple steroid. This will decrease the inflammation uh, and will hopefully give some reliable pain relief uh, for roughly three months. This is not going to reverse the arthritic process. It is just trying to give some simple pain relief. Um, and uh, it's, difficult, it's difficult to predict how long the injection will last. Uh, recently, there's been in interest in hyaluronic acid or visco supplementation or uh, the gel shots, you'll hear them called. Uh, these are very common in the knee, although these are also are being uh, phased out as the research has not really backed up uh, their efficacy. So currently for the hip, these are not FDA approved and they have not been shown to be any better than a placebo injection, although they are safe. Uh, next, I get asked uh, uh, nearly daily about um, what, I'll, what I will call the biologic injections. These are um, platelet-rich plasma and stem cells. Uh, I'll start first with platelet-rich plasma. Uh, so what is PRP? Uh, PRP is, a, is a, a product of your own blood. It's a spin down and a filtrate of your own blood trying to extract some of the uh, proteins and cell signaling molecules that will increase uh, healing potential. Um, in, on the bench top, there has been shown some uh, improvement in cartilage growth, uh, uh, maybe some more lubrication from intact cartilage cells. Uh, unfortunately, this has not been uh, proven in patients. Uh, as of now, there's four um, relatively high quality studies uh, and they've been really no difference uh, in comparison to the gel shots or hyaluronic acid. Uh, they are safe, um, uh, but there's been no, uh, no big change up to a year from the injection. The next most common question is stem cells. So uh, just Googling stem cells and, and hip or knee. Uh, so currently there are no studies in, um, available in the hip. Uh, so anything we talk about hip stem cell injections, we are pulling from the knee uh, research. In the knee, stem cells appear safe. There is a slight improvement in, in pain on par with a steroid injection. And there is no uh, reliable change in the x-ray or even repeat MRIs, there's no signs of cartilage growth. Um, so currently, uh, biologics uh, uh, are not FDA approved. The outcomes are relatively unknown. They do appear safe. Um, they will cost a lot. It will be pure out of pocket. Um, and I can promise you your x-rays won't change. Um, as such, we really have shied away from any uh, heavy use of, of any biologic injections. Next, we get to arthroscopic treatment. Uh, so uh, you've, you may have heard of the uh, a cleanup surgery in the knee. Uh, we tried this in hips in the 90s and 2000s, so going in and cleaning out some bone spurs or uh, some cartilage damage. Unfortunately, this did not help. In fact, it hurt patients um, to the point that if anyone has any even small amounts of arthritic changes, a hip clean-out surgery or hip arthroscopy uh, may actually worsen your symptoms. Um, uh, so hip arthroscopy has been reserved uh, for people that have minimal to no arthritic changes. Uh, once we remove arthroscopy from the uh, treatment options, we're, we're not left with much else other than a, a hip replacement. Um, so I will, I will run through the, the, the history of hip replacements uh, quickly. Um, so hip replacements began in the 60s and 70s. Prior to that, we were doing fusions where we try to fuse the bones together to, to decrease pain. Uh, this did very poorly and had a failure rate of about 50% at five years. Uh, John Charnley came uh, from Britain in the 60s and 70s and began replacing hips. He would use bone cement, cemented a metal stem, and then a plastic cup. Uh, he did relatively well when you compare him to what came before but his infection rate was, was off the charts at 20%. Uh, so much so, he almost abandoned the procedure completely uh, before uh, improving his techniques to decrease the infection rate. 
Uh, we get into the 80s and 90s uh, thank you, thanks to our dentist colleagues that were getting very good at getting dental implants to grow onto bone. We used some of their technology and were able to get our hip implants uh, to grow uh, into bone. This led to uh, much better outcomes and much lower infection rates uh, to uh, where we get 97% success rate at 10 years. Uh, we also got our infection rate down to 2%. Uh, so modern hip replacement, what to expect? Uh, I will kind of run through the different uh, parts, uh, starting with anesthesia. Uh, so prior to moving to the hip surgery uh, in pre-op, uh, you, you, you'll ask to get a routine physical with your primary care physician uh, or any specialist, that's a cardiologist or a lung doctor, um, some simple blood work. Um, uh, and then there's a class that's now moved online uh, due to the uh, coronavirus um, issues. Um, anesthesia, we do 90% of our surgeries with a spinal anesthetic. This is great for patients. The pain, they have much less pain. Also better for the surgeon is and there's less um, issues with, with nausea later. Uh, we also uh, have worked on pain relief. We do quite a bit of injections into the, into the hip during surgery. And then we use all those medications we talked about um, uh, prior to surgery. Uh, then we have to choose our implants. So as we've gone along, the implants have gotten shorter and smaller. This makes them easier for us to put in through a smaller incision. Uh, so currently, the state of the art would be a titanium implant with the goal of getting the bone to grow on to both the, the femur or the, the ball side and the socket side. Uh, so you'll come to our office, we plan plan the surgery out before we get in the operating room. We use digital templating to uh, see what sizes to expect uh, before moving forward. Uh, and then finally, we have to choose what actual bearing we're going to use. So what is the, what is the articulation going to be? Um, so uh, Dr. Uh, Charnley was using plastics, and the plastics had um, some significant issues. They wore at a very high rate. Uh, this led to significant bone loss and uh, loosening of the parts. Um, in, an, in an effort to remove plastic uh, from the equation, we, we tried metal on metal. Uh, this was in the 90s and 2000s. Uh, did very well at the, on the bench top, uh, but unfortunately in patients there was uh, significant issues with some leaching out of the metal ions, uh, so much so that we uh, almost uh, never offer this anymore. Um, due to some of the recalls that have been popularized um, in the media. Um, after uh, metal on metal, we went to ceramic on ceramic. Uh, unfortunately, my video is not going to play, but uh, one big issue with ceramic on ceramic uh, was that they can squeak, and patients do not like their hips to squeak. Um, uh, so while ceramic is a, is a nice hard uh, material, uh, the chance of a, your, your, your hip squeaking is uh, usually a risk that most patients won't, are, are not willing to accept. Uh, so that has decreased the usage of the ceramic on ceramic. Uh, so the plastics have been the biggest uh, improvement of the last 10 to 15 years. So we've gotten much better at making plastics that are much harder and last uh, much longer uh, to uh, going on 30 years now. Um, uh, so now that we've uh, gotten back to plastics, we have to choose how we're going to get into your hip. So there are three main uh, ways to, to, to get in. The, the two most popular will be the anterior and the posterior. I will touch on those. Uh, the posterior approach is, a, is a, an excellent approach. It's safe. It's been used uh, for about 75% of the surgeries currently. Um, there are some issues uh, with uh, the rehab. It can take a little bit longer. Um, just because we have to divide uh, the gluteus maximus muscle to get into the hip. Uh, an anterior hip uh, a surgery or a surgery from the front uh, is, is nice because we can go around uh, the muscles. Uh, recovery is, a, is, a, is a slightly quicker, but at about six months, there's not much difference. Um, there is a, a, a more difficult learning curve uh, with the anterior approach. Uh, so I'm an anterior surgeon, so that's what I will discuss uh, going forward. So to help us get the implants into place, uh, we use this special table. It looks a bit medieval, but it allows us to orient your hip in space uh, while we replace it. 
Uh, so we'll use x-ray, uh, we go down to the hip joint, we actually re remove the ball, um, uh, and then we uh, shape the socket. Uh, we use x-ray to make sure we, we, we impact this uh, uh, right where we want, and we um, impact that titanium socket into place. Uh, then we uh, insert the titanium uh, stem uh, uh, to uh, give you a new ball. Uh, to make sure your legs are the same length, we'll take x-rays during surgery of both hips um, and then use an overlay technique to ensure we've got um, the hips uh, where we want them. Uh, so after surgery, uh, you can expect um, uh, to even go home the same day if you're, if you're young and healthy enough. Otherwise, it's an overnight stay. Uh, you would use a walker for about a week or two and then transition to a cane. Uh, we, we allow for progressive activity, but we do ask you to take it easy for about six weeks as the bone grows onto those implants, uh, which is the overall goal of surgery. Um, so we'll, we'll, we'll pause briefly uh, for questions. Um, and just in, in, in conclusion, uh, so modern, modern hip, hip replacement has uh, been quite successful uh, with um, with um, uh, survival rate over 90, 98% at 10 years. Uh, and uh, with some of the advancements in the technology, we're able to um, get you uh, out of the hospital even at the same day now. Uh, so we'll start to take some questions. Um, so first, uh, uh, is there a role for homeopathic pain? Uh, reduction with products like Arnica or CBD creams? Okay, so uh, this is a good question. So Arnica um, and some of these other uh, uh, medications like uh, um, uh, some of the other naturally occurring anti-inflammatories, they actually have the same mechanism of action as Advil or Aleve. Um, so you will, we will commonly have patients get quite a bit of pain relief um, from some of the uh, more natural uh, anti-inflammatories. Uh, so it's St. John's wort is another common one we'll hear about. Um, the CBD creams uh, are very popular again now. Um, currently, uh, there's no good research showing that there's a dramatic effect. Anecdotally, we'll have patients say, that, yeah, the CBD cream is uh, making a, a big difference. Uh, we did do some research at, uh, at the Hogue Orthopedic Institute for um, some of these uh, CBD creams and uh, didn't appear to be a dramatic change in the pain, uh, but uh, the research is still, still coming. Uh, so what physical therapy options um, uh, can we do before a surgery? Uh, and then how long is the rehab after a surgery? Uh, so physical therapy before a surgery, um, uh, on average, can last about nine months uh, if you have true hip arthritis. Uh, um, uh, but it's always uh, a good idea to begin with therapy first. Um, we've had patients have uh, uh, years of pain relief with some simple therapy. Uh, if you're asking if there's anything you can do to prevent the progression of arthritis, uh, nothing has been shown to, to stop it, um, uh, but decreasing the high impact activities, that's you know, running, um, heavy weightlifting, these types of things, uh, will definitely slow the progression of the arthritis, but as far as simple physical therapy, there's uh, nothing has been proven. Um, rehab after hip replacement surgery, um, I often tell my patients you can expect to be on a walker or a cane for two weeks. I see my patients back at the six week mark. Uh, oftentimes they'll walk into the office and I'm unable to pick out what hip we did. Um, but if they go out for a long walk or go try to play golf, uh, it'll be sore. Uh, so at six weeks, most patients are doing you know, excellent, um, but it takes about three months before you're back um, you know, really doing any of the high level activities um, you were hoping to get back to. Uh, next question is, what is the maximum uh, amount of cortisone shots you can get in the same hip? Uh, so it's a great question. Uh, so cortisone um, is, is trying to decrease the inflammation inside the hip. It's not reversing the, or the, the disease process. Um, 
and it does have some side effects. So it can, it can hurt some of the cartilage that is left in the hip. Uh, as such, we try to space out our hip injections to at least every three months uh, would be the soonest we would, we would uh, repeat a hip injection. And then I like to say, you know, no more than three or four. Um, uh, usually we see diminishing returns with uh, repeat injections. Uh, the um, pain relief doesn't last quite as long. Um, and we do know that if you've had a, a significant amount of injections in your hip, and you go on to needing a hip replacement, you do have a slightly higher risk of infection. Uh, so we are very uh, cognizant of when the last injection was. Uh, and if it's been within three months, we, we, we ask you to wait uh, before having any surgery. Uh, what treatment options are available with a degenerative labral tear? So um, the issue with this question is the degenerative part. Uh, so a labral tear, so the labrum, what is the labrum? The labrum is a, um, a circular piece of rubber that sits around the socket of the hip and aids in some of the, some of the padding. It's much like the meniscus of the knee. Uh, so there's two types of labral tears. There's an acute labral tear you'll see in an athlete, someone you know, falls or has an injury and has a, has a sharp onset of pain. Those are oftentimes amenable to a hip arthroscopy or a camera surgery where, where we can go in and either fix the tear or uh, trim the tear out. A degenerative labral tear, if it's degenerative, um, is usually a result of some underlying arthritis. Um, so again, back in the 90s and 2000s, we would go in and try to fix these or clean them up with, with the camera, uh, but patients oftentimes did worse. Um, so. For most degenerative labral tears, we try to treat your symptoms. That would be an oral anti-inflammatory or an occasional injection. Uh, and if these fail to, to help, oftentimes we're left with, with a hip replacement. Uh, but uh, it's, it's difficult to get uh, reliable pain relief um, with an arthroscopic uh, treatment. Uh, does cortisone cause degrading of the cartilage? So, so yes, that's why we space them out. Um, uh, but uh, uh, a single cortisone injection has a, a relatively minimal um, effect on on the good cartilage cells. It's the it's the buildup in multiple injections. So we find if we space them out, we don't see as many side effects of the of the cortisone shots. Does CBD do anything? Um, so we, we did address this uh, a little bit earlier. Uh, and right now, it's hard to tell. Uh, the hip itself is a, is a relatively deep joint. It's why you need either ultrasound or x-ray uh, to, uh, to make sure your injections are going to the right place. Uh, so topical creams classically haven't been very successful in treating hip arthritis. Um, and uh, I wouldn't anticipate a CBD cream uh, to be a huge game changer uh, at this point either. Is there a metric um, whether patients uh, are satisfied with the eventual outcome? Uh, I assume this means after after a hip replacement. Um, so yeah, we use uh, it's, uh, quite a bit, of, we, and we do participate in quite a bit of research at the, at the Hogue Orthopedic Institute. Um, uh, there are a few metrics. Uh, my favorite is the forgotten joint score. So we will, we will give this to our patients at six months and a year after surgery, uh, with the goal being patients have forgotten they've had a hip replacement. Um, and we are uh, uh, very successful, especially in the hip replacement world, at getting patients back uh, to um, their lives where they don't even think about having a hip replacement. Um, and that's probably on the order of 90, 95%. Uh, patients are, are quite happy uh, with their replacement. Do I have any opinion about the suprapath approach? Um, so the suprapatha or the surpath, suprapath is a, um, it's a take on the posterior approach. Um, it is a fine way to do hip replacement. Um, the um, uh, big difference is they try to save some of the smaller um, muscles around the hip. Uh, it, it, as long as your surgeon is, is used to and facile with using that approach, your outcome should be uh, pretty good. Um, the superpath is just uh, 
uh, a take on a, on a standard posterior approach. Uh, my biggest message as far as approaches and, and, uh, and, and what to look for is uh, you want your surgeon to be comfortable doing whatever approach they're going to do and, they, and that they use. So I would never ask a posterior approach surgeon to do an anterior approach or an anterior surgeon to do a super path approach just because you read something um, uh, online uh, or your friend or, or so-and-so had this approach. Uh, the vast majority of approaches are, are excellent. Uh, and if you go to a surgeon that does a high number of hip replacements, odds are you're going to have a very good outcome. Um, so uh, it's, it, it's hard to say that one approach is better than another. Uh, and they've all been, they all have been compared. Um, and in, in the super path, as long as the surgeon is, 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 uh, is uh, good at that approach, uh, you should have a good outcome. Uh, so our last question uh, we'll end with um, tonight. Uh, do you send uh, patients to a physical therapist after surgery? So after surgery, we will send a therapist to the patient's house uh, for the first two weeks. Um, uh, after that, uh, we have the patients uh, walk on their own mostly um, up until about the six week mark. At that six week visit, uh, I'll, I'll have a discussion with my patients uh, um, uh, and at that, in, it, it, at that point we'll decide on who needs to go to formal therapy. Um, if we go before the six week mark, oftentimes um, I find it's, it's, it's a bit of a waste uh, because the patients want to do higher level activities that's using you know, gym equipment or doing some weights, um, and they're unable to get to get that that early from a surgery. Uh, but after the six week mark, most patients are able to to um, to get that, and that's when we would order it. Uh, I'd say over half my patients uh, at the six week mark will say, you know, I'm I'm doing well, and I, I, I at this point don't feel I need therapy, which is fine too. Uh, the hip is very different than the knee replacement. Uh, for hips, we don't worry as much as uh, don't worry as much about uh, the range of motion uh, because it's a ball and socket joint. We don't have to worry too much about getting the motion back. It it will oftentimes come back on its own. Uh, so that's one of the biggest reasons uh, therapy isn't as important, in, especially in the beginning. Uh, but uh, after the six week mark, it's about a 50-50 whether or not the patients need need the intensive therapy. Other side effects to hip replacements, right? So, uh, uh, good question. So yeah, every surgery has risks. Uh, for hip replacements, I'd say the number one risk we worry about is infection. It's about a 1% chance. Uh, this can happen either at surgery, can happen after surgery, can happen 10 years after your hip replacement. Uh, we do everything very, very clean, uh, very carefully, and we do have a very low infection rate at Hoag, uh, but even with that, uh, they still happen. Uh, and they're devastating when they do happen. Oftentimes it's another surgery. Uh, you have to do an extended course of intravenous or IV antibiotics. Uh, and then uh, may, ha may have to have one, maybe two more surgeries to try to cure the infection. Uh, the, the second most common would be dislocation. Um, and dislocation is one of the things that is, is uh, dependent on how you had the hip put in. Uh, so for me, I do an anterior approach. So my biggest worry is people extending their hips. So that's putting your leg behind you and turning your foot out. Um, luckily, we don't get into that position too much in life, uh, but it can dislocate if we do that. Uh, so it's usually high-level yoga people, I have to warn. Um, and then if we do a posterior approach, classically, it's with your hip bent or flexed up and your foot turned out. We do get here quite more common in life. If you're sitting in a chair and you drop something, you bend over to pick it up. That's a very common way where the hip can dislocate. Um, the other uh, uh, things we worry about are leg length uh, uh, discrepancies. So oftentimes we have to lengthen a leg during hip replacement surgery to make the muscles tight to keep it from dislocating. Uh, we use x-ray during the surgery to make sure the legs are the same length. But even with that, there's still a slight chance you have uh, maybe a few millimeters here or there uh, of a leg length difference. And the last would be, um, you know, the bones breaking in surgery. Uh, we have to put these parts in very firm to allow you to walk right away. Uh, but if that happens, we're oftentimes able to, to, to fix the fracture um, during the surgery. And it doesn't, 
usually affect your, your, your outcome in the long run. Uh, all right, so that'll end it for the question session. I'd like to thank everybody for joining us. Um, uh, you can look forward to additional uh, lectures uh, from Hogue. Uh, and if you have any hip questions, uh, feel free to come visit us at our website uh, for the Hogue Orthopedic.